big surprise, we're going to be talking about the Pocus Fast Abdomen. Um, so uh, I had the pleasure of going through a lot of old slides that we have and condensing this down to, I think, more of a, I don't know, basic kind of talk. Um, and I know that people always, especially with the fast, want to know about evidence and that sort of stuff. So I'm going to quickly highlight that stuff. But I would say that at some point down the road, it's a good talk for a fellow. Oh, God, Mark, it feels good. Uh, to uh, sometimes think about going through a lot of those those papers that are out there because there's a ton of stuff about the fast that's out there. It's one of the most studied areas, and uh, in particular for our kids, you know, the evidence is is quite uh, contrarian to uh, you know doing the fast in a lot of regards. But um, we'll talk a little bit about why we still think the fast is a useful test to know about and where it may fit in, which, uh, which is becoming, you know, sort of uh, more and more clear as the evidence kind of mounts. Um, so we're going to talk about the historical basis of FAST. We'll talk about the technique, of course. We're going to interpret some images and uh, talk about some of the areas of limitation in the images that we're obtaining. We'll briefly review the relevant evidence base in pediatrics, and we'll discuss possible alternate roles within and outside the trauma setting uh, for this application. So as a quick background, the uh, FAST application is fully integrated into the adult trauma activation and ATLS teaching. So in the ATLS book, you can find it within the primary survey as an adjuvant test. Um, while used for the assessment, uh, so when it's used in the assessment of adult patients, uh, a positive FAST may contribute to some intervention decisions. Um, the classic use of the FAST has been in an unstable test where, or an unstable patient where you have a positive test that that's going to result in a um, rapid progression to the OR as opposed to getting a CT. Although even in adults now with uh, angioembolectomies and stuff like that, there's, there's some role where that's kind of maybe becoming a little less clear. Um, the uh, pediatric literature would uh, suggest that that we can't use it in a similar capacity in short. Um, and we know that pediatric patients are obviously different in terms of trauma than adult counterparts. We have kids that uh, have fewer not fewer, sorry, more non-operative outcomes, fewer actual significant traumas. Um, and so our kids, just even when you take the prevalence part of any, you know, as, as you know, with any test, when the prevalence decreases, your ability to use that test um, as a sort of uh, clear and sensitive role is going to be even, even more difficult to do. So since our prevalence is quite low, you know, the problem with the test is going to become more exacerbated by that. Um, so uh, transducers, why do we use these two transducers? So low frequency, right? So you guys did that knobology stuff yesterday or last week. Um, and how do these two probes differ? Like which the one on the left is a what? So how do these differ? What's the difference between a phase, phased array and a curvilinear probe? It's obvious that there's a bigger footprint in the curvilinear, right? That's that's so the the the, the sort of superficial way of answering is to say we like using a phased array in kids because it fits in tight spaces, right? Uh, and curvilinear is more adaptable in adults because they don't worry so much about the tight spaces. But what is the actual essential difference between a curvilinear probe and a phased array probe? It's Sorry, I'm a, no. Um, so, so, so how, like, I guess that what I'm getting at here is because something I didn't understand for a few months in my fellowship was, was what the, what a phased array is doing as opposed to a curvilinear. So a curvilinear probe is going to be very similar to a linear probe in the sense that it's actually sending out an, like these waves constantly in one direction, right? It's curved though. So that directions are sort of spread out, but you know, each, each crystal is sending out a, a sort of a wave that's coming back to those crystals and being red. And so when you look at that image, you're going to get that curved picture right on the screen. You're going to get that kind of, um, uh, pear shaped kind of thing with, with big at the bottom and, and sort of more narrow at the top. Um, and then with a phased array, you're going to get more of a cone shape where you get a very pointy pyramid kind of top with the curve at the bottom as well. Um, and what a phased array is actually doing, um, when they talk about an array, think about like satellite arrays, like those things that they have out in the middle of the desert, right? Where they have all the, or the, the observatories where they have all the mirrors that are going in different directions all the time, right? To look at planets and 
that sort of thing. Um, and so a phased array within the sort of space of very, very short time, so within milliseconds, is shooting a, an image to the left, shooting an image straight, shooting an image to the right, and doing that in a phase. So it's, it's first phase is to left, first next phase is going to be up, next phase is going to be to the right. And so it sends out all these different um, signals and then interprets them as they come back. So it's, it's sending out multiple waves in different directions so that the actual crystals are shifting to, to look in different directions and then interpreting that information. Does that make sense? Does that, is that, I don't know if I'm explaining that in a great way, but it's sending out a lot of different information in uh, different directions and then interpreting them as opposed to its crystals being aligned in one particular direction all the time. So by doing that, it allows you to see um, sharp angles that you wouldn't otherwise see with a small footprint. Something to look up. There's some good, uh, and we can I can try and find you some afterwards if, you're, if that's not clear, just that talks about, like there's some good YouTube videos out there that talk about the basic physics. It's not super important to understand clinically, but it is useful to know kind of in terms of trying to figure out uh, why your probe works the way it does and what does it actually mean when we say phased array. So positions. Um, so this stuff should be pretty uh, clear to people who've done a fast before. Um, two things to point out here, though, I've left them in red, the, the lungs. Um, when we think about fast, uh, we are really talking about an e-fast, an extended fast, um, or enhanced fast. Um, I'm not going to be covering the lung stuff today. I think Katie's covering that next week. So I've left those in red. Um, the first area we're going to talk about is that right upper quadrant. So um, this, uh, these videos, which we've got for each thing, are actually pretty good. So they give you a quick demonstration of what the technique is. So basically what we're talking about is aligning your phased array or curvilinear probe along the mid-axillary line, um, sometimes even more posterior to that, of course, uh, on the lower costal margin with the probe marker towards the patient's head um, as per sort of convention, of course. Um, and it's important to point out that the windows are going to be different for each patient, right? So this is a test where you don't know what you're going to see as soon as you put the probe on, right? So sometimes you put it on at the same position in one person as a different person and you get the image and in another person you don't get the image. And so you have to tinker a little bit and move that probe around until you start finding those, those structures that you're looking for. Um, because in each person, they can be slightly different, though not so different that it becomes difficult as a rule. Um, this, this picture is nice because it does give you a good 3D, three-dimensional look at you know, where the um, structures we're looking at are and also why we say it's important to actually look around in the different um, areas and not just look at one image, right? So your fast is not just this image. It's going to be you scanning up towards this liver edge here and scanning down. So I always talk about scanning through the kidney, scanning through the liver, um, so that you can kind of say, I've seen the top, I've seen the bottom. And so because I've seen the top and the bottom, I've seen everything I need to see in terms of the structures, right? Um, and then, of course, scanning up to look underneath that uh, liver edge. So in a perfect fast video is going to be one that shows us underneath the liver edge, um, and shows us that Morrison's pouch, the, the, the interface between the kidney and the liver, and then shows us the liver tip. Um, the, the great challenge of the year is trying to get, you know, those videos in a nice, uh, succinct eight-second clip. Um, so here's a normal image. Now, this one is normal, but doesn't actually show us all those things I was talking about. So just be warned about that. Like, we're not seeing the liver edge here, um, and, and otherwise we're seeing a lot of good stuff. So what's this down here? spine, right? And this would be normal because we're, you know, or at least we're not seeing the spine sign, which we talk about when we see fluid within the, um, within the pleura here. And then we, we, we start seeing the spine carrying on into the, uh, the, the rest of the chest cavity. Um, here we're seeing that spine uh, diminish as the lung uh, goes down and, you know, increase as the lung goes up, which is a normal finding. Um, in terms of, uh, this is obviously Morrison's pouch here, that potential space, and, and then this is the area underneath the diaphragm. So these are some of the important areas to look at, and of course we would want to look at that liver edge, but we don't actually see that through here. 